So, Lord God, we thank you for uh, your blood. And, Lord, I thank you that it's the flow that's precious. And it's your life that's in the blood. And each one of us is somehow your temple. And there's a fountain that wells up inside. And it flows to other people from one to the other. And then back to the throne. And on the throne is somehow the head. And you live your life through us, Lord God. I have a hard time believing that. But I thank you that even that is a gift from you. And what you started, you will finish. So, Lord, we worship you. Uh, Lord God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, in, in Jesus' name, the Savior's name, amen. Hey, uh, it's great to see you. You know, we've, if you've been around a while, you know, we've been preaching through First and Second Peter, and we're taking a break today, which is good, because we just got through Second Peter chapter 2, which will knock your head off if you aren't ready for it. Um, but I'm really excited that Brad Jerzyk will be uh, preaching this morning. Brad's been a friend of the sanctuary for what? Like, it was like seven years ago or something? We, yeah, or six or something. But anyway, he uh, spoke at our conference, the Forgotten Gospel Conference, and gotten to know Brad over the years, and really uh, appreciate him. He's a, a gift to all of us. Uh, but Brad's, the, you're the, your name is Dean. You're Dean of the Theology of... The principal? You're the principal? Of the university, yeah. Serious? Yeah. Wow. That makes me nervous because... Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so nobody goofing around because the principal is giving the... Um, but yeah, so Brad is at the university, uh, St. Stephen's University in New Brunswick. And Brad's written, I think, like 3,000, 4,000 books, and they're all great. But this is the one I've been working through now. Just just came out, Out of the Embers. Um, great book. So, there's a good podcast interview. And there's a podcast interview on this book, on Grace Saves All. Yeah. So, uh, Brad, why don't you come up here, and I, maybe I can just say a prayer for you, and then yeah, you can... And I want to interview you for a moment. Okay. Nothing, right. nothing. Yeah, okay, yeah. Just, uh, oh, the microphone right there, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so, uh, Lord, thank you uh, so very much for Brad. And, oh, I know what I was going to say, Jesus, about... I was going to say this about Brad, and I forgot, but... Um, I can say it with you uh, here listening. Well, you're always listening, but I think I just appreciate so much about Brad is that I know he, he really likes you. He genuinely likes you. And so, Father, we ask that um, our hearts would be open to what you have to give us uh, through Brad and bless him as he offers it, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so this is on. So my my brief interview is just this. Um, what I want to talk about today is the experience of Jesus, the importance of the experience of Jesus. So the Mount of Transfiguration was a amazing experience of the majesty of Jesus, and I would have maybe talked a little bit about how Peter describes it at the end of Second Peter one. Yeah. But you already did that. Yeah. So could you just give me a review of what was your point when you preached on that? What was the takeaway that the congregation had? I have to remember my own sermon. It's, I learned this from trains, plays, and automobiles. Yeah, yeah. When you have a story, have a point, right? And yeah, I, yeah. I know you enough to, that there was. Yeah, yeah. So he, he, he talks about the Holy Mountain. Yep. And the thing that amazes me about the Holy Mountain is that uh, somehow the Holy Mountain moves, and the Holy Mountain's related to Mount Zion and uh, related to that experience with Jesus. And somehow Eden is on top of a Holy Mountain, according to St. Simeon of Sal. No, one of those old guys. One of those guys. His book. Yep. Yeah, and that on the, and on the Holy Mountain, somehow... That's the place where Adam is made and Adam is remade, and we encounter, we encounter God at a, at a tree in a garden. Wow, so, so I can listen to that somewhere online? Yeah. Okay, yeah. I have to do that. That is out there, man. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Is that not what you were shooting for? No, it's yeah. totally what I, I mean, yeah. what an experience, right? Yeah. But it well, also... And, it, and, it's the, and it's the telos. He's yeah, like, yeah, yeah. He's yeah. at the... He's at the te, he sees the telos. Yeah, so some of the folks here wouldn't know that I'm from an Eastern Orthodox tradition. And for us, our vision of 
the end isn't like all the Armageddon stuff we lost, yeah. we, 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 the, the left behind, the great tribulation, yeah. blah, blah, blah. Uh, our vision of the end is the Mount of Transfiguration and the experience they have. And the guy named the end, right? Isn't that amazing? Yeah. Okay, so thanks, you, Peter. Am I done with my You're, you're done. Okay, okay right. thanks. Appreciate it. Yeah. yeah. So, so, and then Peter... Peter, when he's talking about this, he's saying, like, we didn't just make up stories here. We actually saw this. We ourselves heard this voice that came from heaven when we were with him. And, and he's, he wants us to know that they experienced the Lord Jesus Christ for themselves and that they were actual eyewitnesses of this and that this really, really mattered, right? So I have a, I have a assignment that I've been waiting to give my students at university since I was a student in 19, uh, this would be 86. I was an undergrad, I was in fourth year, they wanted me to write an article and I said, here's what I would love to do. I would love to give my students an assignment where they have to tell me about the nature of God but they can only speak from their experience. It can't be from their coursework. It can't be from their, uh, their readings in our textbooks. It can't even be from the Bible. It's like, I want to know what you've experienced of God. And so I finally got to give that assignment like three weeks ago. And so I gave them, you know, maybe five or ten minutes to write down who God is, but only in terms of being an eyewitness encounter. And then after about 10 minutes of writing, I had them share one-on-one -on -one or in little groups of two or three their experience of God as, their, as how they know him. So that it's not just head knowledge, uh, but that it's a heart knowledge of a lived life where encounters with God happen. Why would I give that kind of... Um, I should check my time too. Okay, so you want, you'd, it'd be best if I stopped right at 11, is that about right? Or when do you usually go? A little bit? Okay. So, so the reason why I think that, uh, got it. The, uh, the reason why I think that assignment is so important is because of what we've called the great deconstruction. And that is, as people are beginning to feel the freedom to question their constructs, that's what deconstruction is. You question your ideas and notions and beliefs, and you're meant to. But as people do this, I'm seeing one of two things happen. Some question their constructs all the way down to virtually nothing, and then they walk away from Jesus as if they've never met him. And in fact, I will say, I get that you could maybe need to leave the church or theology or even the Christian brand, but to walk away from Jesus, have you not met him? No. Well, they had, but they didn't see it. They didn't recognize it. They weren't attentive to it in a way then that they can just set Jesus aside as an idea because they've got a better idea now. I'm seeing another group that once the, once the constructs have been shaved down and, 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 and like burnt to the ground even, there's still a ground. There's still a foundation. There's still a relation. They, I can't walk away from him. He's the kindest person I've ever met. He saved my life. I was spiraling down into non-being and he came in and I met him. So, that kind of knowing is much different than this other kind of knowing that we might have received as indoctrination or as an inheritance from, you know, we, we've got to have an experience of Jesus. And I, I would say that can be seen very generously, and I'll get to that in a moment. But let's pop in now to uh, 1 John chapter 1. He's going to talk about this experience of Jesus. From the very first day we were there, I guess we're hearing about, you know, on the beach when Jesus calls John the Beloved to follow him. The very first day, we were there taking it all in. We heard it with our own ears, saw it with our own eyes, verified it with our own hands. This was an experience of Jesus. They knew him. And he's talking to a community where there had been some, you know, false teachers came along and said, oh, by the way, 
uh, Jesus Christ did not come in the flesh. And John's like, wait a minute. We saw him, heard him, touched him, smelled him. It's kind of not real fellowship unless you don't smell someone. I think that, that's probably, that's the, that's the, you know. Um, yeah, very delightful smell, aroma, the aroma of life, right? The word of life appeared right before our eyes. We saw it happen. So the word became flesh and dwelt among us, made us pitch a tent among us for a while, and we experienced that. Now we're telling you in the most sober prose that what we witnessed was incredibly this. The infinite life of God himself took shape before us. We saw it. We heard it. And now we're telling you why. So you can experience it along with us. That's quite a leap. Because what he's saying is, what we experience with our five senses, you can experience too. But wait. Christ has ascended. Uh, the Jesus we know is invisible to our earthly eyes, our earthly material ears. To the, the, we, we don't feel that touch or texture in a material way. So how can you say you can have the same experience? And um, I know that there, there are those who would have, let's say, rare occasions where Christ appears to them in a form that you could touch. But even people like uh, the Apostle Paul, it was more like a blinding light that knocked him off his high horse, right? Uh, and, and so this is really wild. It's, it's an incredible invitation to experience Christ, not, I would say, in a way perhaps even greater than if we could see him with, uh, if he showed up in Jerusalem, right? Can you imagine how long the lineup would be to get to talk to him? Um, it is to our advantage that he went away and sent his spirit so that every single one of us can encounter and embrace and be loved on by him every day, wherever you live, without a lineup. So anyway, let's carry on. We saw it, we heard it, we're telling you so you can experience it along with us. This experience of communion with the Father and his Son, Jesus Christ. Communion is an awesome word. It, we're we're going to have communion later on purpose. Living presence. Communion with God. Uh, how, I, I like to talk about it as encounter, but here's what happens. If I say, you need to have an encounter with Jesus, you can't, I can't tell you how many times people have said to me, oh, I, I, I've never had a dramatic encounter. I'm like, I, I promise you I didn't say dramatic. Because then you wait to get zapped at some point. What I'm talking about is an ongoing living connection with full access to the heart of God and, uh, and, and, and access to communion with God through Jesus Christ through, and, and with his Father, which, which Jesus in the Gospel of John defined as this is eternal life. Not if you pray the right prayer, when you die, you'll go to heaven someday. But this is eternal life. This communion of knowing God and experiencing that union with the Father and the Son who he sent by the Spirit our motive for writing is simply this. We want you to enjoy this too. Uh, your joy will double our joy. And so back to Peter. I remember reading First or Second Peter, which is the one where it says joy unspeakable. Anybody remember the reference? Doesn't matter. As the author of Hebrews says. <laughs> Somewhere it says. If, if the author of Hebrews can say that, I can say So, But, it, but I'm reading about this joy unspeakable, and, and again, this is in the 80s, and I'm like, I have no idea what you're talking about. That has never happened to me. I don't know what joy unspeakable is. I, 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 and so I was, I, I was really alarmed, because I'm like, at that point, I was heading into a master's degree. I was going to get a master of divinity. Can you think of a more blasphemous title? Oh, 
Yeah, but at least you're the doctor of ministry. You're ministry. But now I'm the master of God himself. <laughs> divinity comes to me. It's, oh, yes. No, it's, to, anyway. So this master of divinity didn't, had never known joy unspeakable as an actual experience of relationship. That's kind of a problem. I want to I tell you about the first time I experienced the heart of God, experienced it where I knew, oh, this is specifically God's love. I, I, I've had, I've se I'd seen and been engaged and encountered miracle stuff, but I'm talking about the heart of God's, the Father towards me. So now I was a pastor, and now we're into the 2000s. And yeah, I'd had liver shivers in charismatac meetings, that kind of thing, but uh, yeah. Um, but, but on this occasion, I was in a very dark place. It, it's a time I shared about a little in the conference where my, my life was falling apart. I was unraveling badly, and I was, I was undergoing tremendous um, inner turmoil and torment, and, and, and it was acting out of that, and it was very harmful. And in that, I entered a, some pretty intense self-loathing. And... And a lot of suicidal ideations. It's just kind of a thing in my family. We go there way too easily. And, um, and so I know I, needed a, I know I needed a refuge. And the one safe place I knew where I was probably safe from myself and safe in the world was a place called Circle of Friends. It was a Monday morning coffee house for people with disabilities in full-time care. It, and it, it is a riot quite literally. So people with uh, Down syndrome, autism, rows and rows of wheelchairs, probably 200 people would show up for this coffee house, half of which were care workers, or maybe a third were care workers, and the rest were people with disabilities. And they would have a sing-along worship time. So, uh, um, and like, with, they're singing things like um, the classic camp songs or uh, this little light of mine, for example, and, and so you've got people up on a stage about this tall, and, and, and so they've got banners and ribbons and tambourines and djembes and guitars, and, and, the, and all these folks from the care homes are like full-on involved in it and dancing, and it's just mayhem, <laughs> and so glorious. I'm like, that's a safe place for me. So I go into the back. I'm sitting in a back pew in my self-loathing and self-pity, which is a false self in me, I think. And um, Kit's up on stage. Now, Kit was a guy with, with Down syndrome, but he, uh, and very mainly nonverbal. I, he, he would try to talk. He'd go, er, 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 And then he would say, amen. So you knew he was praying. And Kit's playing the djembe definitely to his own drumbeat. And he's, and he's on the stage, and he sees me in the back pew. And he leaves his djembe, and he comes down, and he walks up the aisle, and he takes me, and he's about this tall. He always wears, like, you know those yellow vests that crews wear on the road? He's always wearing one of those completely smeared, usually in um, caulking, that he would have been using somewhere, <laughs> you know. This is the guy that pulls the fire alarm in the shopping mall, uh, you know. The, and he comes and he gets me and he grabs me by the arm and he drags me down to the front and, and right where you are, David. And he, and he sits me down and he sits me beside him and he grabs my head with both hands and he pulls it to his heart and he starts stroking my head. And I bawled like a baby. I bawled that way as his funeral too. But I bawled like a baby because I could feel the love of the Father at the deepest place in my hell. Shining like a light in that dark place, which in 2 Peter 1 there again. Shining a light in that dark place that just wanted to, to self-destruct and had been. And we've got this amazing, really dour Russian proverb that Christ redeems in that moment. Here's the proverb. You'll love this. When you think you've hit bottom, you will hear a knock from below. That's Russians for you. 
But here's the redemption, and it's Christ knocking. His, his love has descended deeper than my deepest bottom. Knocked from below, came up, and, and, and brought me the heart of the Father through Kit. And although I was sobbing and actually wailing, it was also with joy unspeakable at the mercy of God. My, that experience, uh, is, it was just life-changing to me. So, these experience, this experience that he's talking about, I, I actually heard it with my ears, saw it with my eyes, felt it with my hands, smelt it on Kit's vest. And it's an experience. So this is, this is the importance of that kind of experience. I can't walk away from Jesus then. Maybe, maybe some do who've had an experience, but they'd have to do it by contriving that I was probably just imagining in that and diminishing that. It's like, I guess if that works for you, I'm telling you it doesn't, right? So here we are gathered today as people who, who believe in the experience of Jesus. And so I know I'm just speaking to the choir, which is pretty cool and a lot easier to do. So um, um, let's shift then into how, how that works. How does that happen? Because you don't want to sit around waiting till you're in a dark moment and have a Down syndrome man come and find you. What if you could like live in the presence of God on purpose, experience this kind of access when you want? Uh, here's another experience. So I, I knew this woman, and she was, uh, she's not a Christian, and she, but she was very... Uh, very open, right? And so, so I said, you seem like a spiritual person. Oh, yes, I am. I do yoga. Okay, good. <laughs> and, and I said, oh, yeah, yeah. That, and, and tell me about that. And she says, well, I, you know, when I do yoga, that's when I can be centered and I can breathe and I can, and, and, and I find peace of heart that I hadn't been, been able to find. Oh, that's really good. That's really good. And, and I said, um, um, so when you do, when you do that, uh, tell me about, like, do you do a mantra or something? And she says, oh, yeah, I have a mantra. And I'm like, okay. And I said, you know, I, I heard a really good mantra that you could do in yoga. She goes, oh, tell me. And I go, what you do is you say Abba. And it's a cry from deep in your heart to experience the Father heart of God. You just say Abba. And, and she said, that's really cool. I should try that. I said, I said, try it right now. It's like, what do you mean? I said, well, just close your eyes and do this and, and just kind of go, Abba. <laughs> and she said, okay. So in front of me, just standing there, she, whatever you do with your hands, and, 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 uh, and she goes, Abba. <gasps> Abba. Oh. And I said, what's happening? <laughs> And she goes, my heart opened up. My chest, my ribs, it all opened wide. And I'm like, and what's that mean? She, here's what she said, total access. I'm like, well, that's a good day. I said, I, I said like, so uh, you should do that all the time. She was like, every day. And so I encouraged her to start her own ABBA yoga studio, but, you know, she kind of chickened out. But she, she knows the on-purpose, total access of the Father heart of God, and she hadn't even said the prayer yet. Because why? Because he's in all, waiting to be found so that our eyes would be open to the one in us. And, then, I mean, that's just basic New Testament stuff, actually. Um, I don't only find it in the New Testament, though. The practicalities of, of how we come to know and experience God. I'm just working on the order of what I should share. So I think, let's show the Maximus slide. So in the early church, they, and in Greece, and, and in, you know, even beyond the church, they talked a lot about knowing there's a library dedicated to um, 
uh, to an uh, early skeptic of the, uh, who really was an opponent of t the church down in, in Ephesus. And on the library, they've got these four virtues that are ways of knowing. And so they were really working at knowing by experiencing, knowing by reason, uh, knowing by practicing virtues, uh, knowing by warranted evidence. So they really would work on knowing. How do we know? And, and it's not just head knowledge. And, he, and the Greeks knew this. And, and so Maximus, the confessor, who's a great church father who, who came to believe that Jesus had a fully human will and at the time was treated as a heretic. They actually cut off his right hand and cut out his tongue so he couldn't write or speak about it. They send him into exile. He dies in exile. 30 years later, they have a council and go, oops, actually, he was completely right. <laughs> This happens a lot, doesn't it, Peter? <laughs> yeah. So the, you, the stuff you get uh, stoned for 10 years later begins to be ripened, I suppose. So here's, here's Maximus talking about, there's two ways of talking about knowing Jesus, and I've already done it, but he's going to help us now. This is one of the greatest church fathers in history. Listen how important experience is for him. We've got about five slides, but I'll run through them quickly. Um, the union, he's talking about the union with Jesus Christ and humanity. The union of God and man in Christ, and the union of God to man in Christ, and the union of God and you in Christ. This union's been manifested so that they might actually, they is us, acquire by experience an active knowledge of him in whom they were made worthy to find their stability and to have abiding unchangeably in them the enjoyment of that knowledge. Enjoyment. So it's not just that I know, but I get to experience the unspeakable joy of a kind of experiential knowledge. The, the scriptural world knows two kinds of knowledge of divine things. So he's just going to reduce it to two. Next slide, please. On the one hand, there's a relative knowledge uh, rooted only in reason and ideas and lacking in the kind of experiential perception of what one knows through active engagement. Such relative knowledge is what we use in order to order our affairs in our present life. So you have to have reason, and that helps you live. But on the other hand, there's also a truly authentic knowledge gained only by actual experience, apart from reason and ideas. That was my assignment to my students. Write that down. I want to know how you know God, and I want to know how you know it in this way. By this latter knowledge, we attain in the future state the supernatural deification that remains unceasingly in effect. In other words, we're being changed from glory to glory into the image of Jesus Christ. How? By beholding him. And uh, let's say, um, uh, so at, at the end there, it's participative knowledge required, acquired, that was a typo, a participative knowledge acquired by active engagement. The rest is just a repetition of this, but let's, let's just go to the next slides anyway and I'll show you the, so look at the verbs and descriptions in the first paragraph, active experiential knowledge, direct perception of the object known, direct experience of God, immediate perception of God. Second paragraph, by perception I mean the experience through participation in the supernatural goods. Third paragraph, direct experience of a thing and it's a direct perception of the thing and that even renders the conceptual knowledge of it useless. My concepts are fluff compared to the direct experience of Jesus Christ. All the, the I've, I've got 12 years of theology under my belt. That moment with Kit eclipses all of that in a moment. It doesn't make the other completely worthless. The other... Uh, Maximus says uh, it creates a curiosity in you. It creates a hunger in you. So that's good. But the hunger is not the food. Um, we can actually, we used to sing like songs about I'm hungry and thirsty for God. I'm like, after about the 12th time, you're like, when do we get to eat? 
I, we made a spirituality of our own hunger, not realizing that unless it's satisfied at the, at the banqueting table of God, that you will end up going to other tables. And that's what I'm talking about with those who've walked away from Jesus. Uh, next slide. By experience, I mean the knowledge based on active engagement which surpasses all reason. By perception, I mean the participation in the known object which manifests beyond conceptualization. So anyway, that's enough of Maximus. You can see how he's banging away at this. There's ways of knowing that are ideas and there's an experience of God that is direct encounter. And what we need to do is work out what that looks like and how to facilitate it in the body of Christ so that People aren't saying, yeah, I went to church for 40 years and I never met him. Not okay. Um, so before I, before I just give you a, a, a few ideas about that, I, here's, I, I actually uh, see God trying to communicate this all over the world, even across faiths. So this year I read the Bhagavad Gita. It's the primary Hindu scripture. It's kind of their gospel. Uh, Krishna, who's kind of a Christ figure, is in it. And and he's explaining how you can experience union with God. I'm like, that's pretty good. That's why I read it four times. I'm like, I am seeing the light of Christ bursting into their own scriptures with an invitation that I think ultimately leads to our Lord. And so what Krishna says is, look, at there's, we have different temperaments. And in those temperaments, there's ways of approaching God and pursuing experience that are different for different people. So uh, he says, for some people, you have philosophical minds and you want to philosophize your way to God. And, and that's a pretty abstract sense of God. And it's really hard, but you know, if that's your thing. But then he goes, but there's a better, there's easier ways and better ways. So if you don't want to philosophize your way to God, uh, one way you can do it is through devotion. And he says, instead of coming to God as an abstract philosophy, you come to God as a divine lover. And you're his bride. And you worship with songs of devotion like you would to somebody you're in love with. And he says, that's actually an easier approach to God. And you'll experience your union with God inside of devotional hymns. I'm like, that's pretty good. And he said, but you know, so, for some of you, now this is a translation from it's not your jam. He says, so if, if that's not your jam, here's what you do. Um, some will find they encounter God through selfless service. Matthew 25, right? Oh, I met him in the prisoner. I met him in the hungry. I met him in the naked. I met him in the sick. And I was just doing selfless service, and I realized, oh my goodness, I just had an encounter with Christ. And so Krishna goes on, and I, I thought, well, that's handy. What if we ask the same question of Christians now? So I just do a little survey. Started with my wife. Um, and so now we're moving into the part of the sermon where I'm like, here's some practical ways of engaging direct, the direct access you already have to the one who's already in you. So this is not about climbing up to somewhere else. But it's like, um, how do I become attentive to what is already precious to me. So I say to my wife, hey, Eden, when I think about experiencing God, one of the ways that happens for me is in my prayer life, where from the time I was very little and my mom taught me to love Jesus, well, she taught me his name and I just loved him, on her lap, to this day, despite my valleys. Sometimes that feels like in the night watch, I pray in the darkness, and he's right here, right here. And I hold my hand there, because he's like even closer than that. But it's like the hearness of God in the quiet of my heart. And I said, what's it like for you? Do you experience God? And she says, every day. And I'm like, okay, tell me how. And she said, it's always through the other. I'm like, what do you mean? She said, I see his face in everybody. I, I just smile at anybody, and they smile back, and their eyes light up, and bam, it, they become a window to Jesus' face. Um, 
And, and some of her experiences with this are incredibly profound. We're out of the blue when she was grieving thyroid cancer. A homeless man comes up to her and this is meant for you and it's a rose in a pure white hanky. And she's like, what? <laughs> oh, I met him today. She is walking the stroller when her kids are younger and, and she meets a Muslim woman in a full burqa where you only see her eyes and the mom looks at no, actually, she didn't have the stroller. The, 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 the mom, the, the Muslim woman had the stroller. My wife's walking, and the woman sees our three adult sons and realizes it's my wife, my, that my wife's the mom, right? And they lock eyes, and the woman just gives her a nod. I know. I know what it's like to be a mom. And she's like, and suddenly Jesus is looking out from the slit in that burqa through the mother eyes of someone in whom Christ lives, if you have the theology for it. And then, okay, so prayer, that's one way. Uh, some of Eden, it's other people encountering him in the other. Um, others, it's like you just know I need to be with Jesus, so you put your headphones on. And you get lost in worship, or you, you enter worship, and you realize in that devotional sense, it's like, oh, I am, um, my lover is mine and I am his, right? I asked Joe Beach this morning, like, where do, where do you meet Jesus? He's like, oh, quite often I will be riding my bike up to Red Rock, and suddenly I will become aware of the presence of God. I will sense the presence that's already there, and, and joy will rise up. The early church fathers and mothers, what they said, is that, that was God's favorite way. He wanted to make it available to everybody. And in making it available to everyone, because the, 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 the cosmos is an appearance of God. It's not an incarnation, but it's an appearance of God. That anybody who wanted to access God, the entire world is your icon. But then he said, but then we got hardness of heart, so he had to send the prophets. And then we heard the prophets, and we didn't like that, so we had to send the scriptures. But it was like his first, his first choice was actually the nature trail. Isn't that interesting? Eh? And so uh, let's just take a moment to think for yourself. Um, well, hang on. All of those things are something people experience every day, but they don't experience it as, a, as God. Like anyone can go for a bike ride. Anyone can look... A Muslim woman in the face. Anyone can do some breathing during yoga. Anybody. So what is the difference between those who go for a walk and those who experience God on that walk? Um, I guess it's attention. I guess it's having our eyes open. It's not striving for it like you've got to grasp at the, this other tree. The knowledge of good, you know, I'm going to grasp at the tree. No, it's more like just being awake being attentive, and not striving, but watching for the ways that God is smiling at you in any given moment. And I've just given you three or four or five, but um, uh, I, think, I think it's very unlikely that you haven't encountered God in one of those ways or some other ways, right? So um, one way... I think we're just going to go into the practice of this on purpose together. So, you, yeah, you can have your personal one-on-one -on -one encounters with Jesus like I was describing, but we are also meant to experience that as a group, as a body, as a family. And, and, and we call this communion. We call this the Eucharist. Um, we call, you know, we call this the Lord's table. And so... Uh, the idea is in, in, the, in the church is, is that through the Holy Spirit, God is present either in the elements or in the act of taking the elements. And, and then, of course, what do we do? Well, we fight over what that means. How about the mystery? That, and here's a wild thing from the, the early church, that the cross is the tree of life. Meaning that, and the cross, by the cross they mean Jesus in his self-giving love, is the tree of life. And that when you come to communion, we have total access through the rent veil. The Garden of Eden's open again. And 
Christ himself comes out and, he's, and he says, uh, I want you to take this bread and I want you to take this wine and I want you to partake of it and ingest it and let it cha- fill you and change you. In other words, welcome back to the garden. You get to eat of the tree of life today on purpose. It's just whatever you think it's just. And all the ways we do just is like minimizing. So today, let's not minimize it at all. Don't think about how to get your head around it. Go with the mystery. Today, I'm going to come up and I'm going to experience Christ by eating of the tree of life. And I'll give it over to you now. Thank you, Brad. And so, uh, on the night that he, uh, the life, Jesus was betrayed by all of us. (laughs) We have known him in the wrong way, right? We just take the life from the tree as if it was a thing that we own. On that night, he took the bread and he broke it saying, this is my body given to you. Take and eat and do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper and having given thanks, he took the cup, saying, this is the covenant in my blood. And they knew, they'd been taught that life is in the blood. So the night before we took the life, he gave the life. And he's the one that gives you life even now. So as you come to the table, you're surrendering yourself. You're saying, God, I, yeah, I, I, you're all around me, and I just take the life. And, and he says, yeah, I know, and I've always given you the life. And then let's worship him, all right, in Jesus' name. Now, the, the uh, dark cups are wine, and the white cups are juice, and you can have both if you want to. Let's worship. And you just did. So, uh, in the name of Jesus, may you believe the gospel. He's all around you. He's at hand, and he's even now. In his name, amen. And if you'd like uh, prayer, Ted would be down front, and uh, he he would definitely love to pray with you, but invite you to stick around for some lunch, all right? And let's say thanks to Brad. Thank you, Brad. Have a great week.